I've been a very, very lucky person in my life, in my family and in my profession. I've traveled the world, good times and bad, and I've met just about everybody that you would want to meet in my lifetime. But for a long time, I was trying to figure out how I was going to get to know Lefty Craig. <laughs> and then it worked out. Thanks to Chris Dorsey, put together the Buccaneers and the Bones. And I must say, it was a match made in heaven. There are so many times in our lives when we hear about people that are heroic in our eyes, and then when we meet them, we're a little bit disappointed because <laughs> they're less than the sum of their parts. This man is more than the sum of his parts. He's 90 years old, and just four weeks ago, we were together in the flats in the Bahamas, and we had him up on the casting platform, sitting first on a nice chest, and then standing up and making those beautiful Lefty Craig cats, and then giving the same kind of commentary that you just heard here. <laughs> the first time I was in a boat with him, we were in uh, the northern Bahamas, and of course, Lefty's presence at any fishing lodge creates a real buzz of excitement. We had two guides, uh, one who was a really a, the last in the line of the Englishmen who left this country during the revolution and went to the Bahamas because they didn't want to fight the crown. The other one was a native Bahamian. Two boats, one camera, and one fishing boat. So we finally break for lunch. And our guide, who is the Englishman, in effect, gets up on the casting platform without saying anything. It is clear to me that he really wants to kind of show off his casting technique. Lefty and I were sitting back there having our lunch. And I said to Lefty, guy's pretty strong. Lefty has this wonderful verbal style. He has a kind of a verbal tick. He said, yeah, he's strong, but <clears throat> he's dumb. <laughs> and the guy turned around and said, what did you say, Mr. Cray? He said, I said, you're strong, but <clears throat> you're dumb. He said, well, what do you mean I'm dumb? He said, if you just turn that back cast a little, a few degrees, a little bit to your right, you're gonna add to it. Mr. Cray, I've been fishing for a long time. He said, mm, dummy, listen to me. <laughs> he did as Lefty told him, added another 30 feet to his cast. Now the Bahamian guide gets up in the next boat, fully aware of who Lefty is and we repeat the procedure. I'm thinking we're gonna start a race war at any moment. <laughs> Fact is, Lefty went through the same routine. <clears throat> Strong, but <clears throat> dumb. <laughs> Guy changes it. That kind of goes away for me until we're back down in the Grand Bahamas at Deepwater Key with the best guy they have, a guy by the name of Mecky that we all love to fish with. Mecky said, you know, Lefty, you were so helpful to me last year. I just want to show you how I've improved my cast. Like he gets up, casts, and Lefty says, mm, dumb, <laughs> not doing the right thing. He said, well, what do you mean? He said, stop when I tell you to stop. So man makes a beautiful back stroke, gets up, and Lefty says, stop. And he goes another five inches. Lefty says, mm, dummy, I told you to stop. He tries two more times, and finally he stops when Lefty tells him to and as God is my witness, the line unfurled in a tight little, tight little loop, another 25 or 30 feet. That's the kind of master that you're dealing with. In all the years that I have been watching great athletes, everybody from Michael Jordan to the Final Four just recently, to the great baseball players I've known, including Sandy Koufax and others, who are at the top of their game. We're in the presence of a master of his craft, and it's very, very difficult to do, as we all know, with precision and perfection and have the kind of personality in which he's modest and constantly eager to teach people. Here's my final story. I was at uh, the Mayo Clinic this morning working on a project. And two and a half years ago, I was diagnosed unexpectedly with multiple myeloma, a cancer. It's a cancer of the bone marrow. And I've had persistent back pain and so I went to the clinic finally and said, the orthopedist hadn't been able to figure it out. Something's going on. And within eight hours, I had a life-changing experience. I was sitting in a small cubicle with a hematologist and my principal physician there. 
They said, you have a malignancy, it's called multiple myeloma. It's a bone and, can and blood cancer. For the next 24 hours, I stayed at the clinic and I had MRIs. My wife was in Montana and I didn't want to tell her over the phone. I wanted to be able to get there. I also had a fishing date with Lefty <laughs> the next day. So I got diagnosed. Here I am facing a life-threatening disease Charter plane, get back to Montana. My head is reeling with what kind of a life am I going to have now? Meet Nurith at the ranch late at night, fix myself a scotch, and give her this disquieting news that our lives are about to change, that I've got a serious form of cancer. Get up the next morning, put my fly rods, my waders in the car, all my fly boxes, and drove 200 miles to go fishing with Lefty Craig. <laughs> so when I told the doctors that today, they said, what the hell were you thinking? <laughs> we had just given you a very serious diagnosis. And I said, you have to understand, you don't get these many opportunities in life. <laughs> the end of the story is, I'm going to be OK. And I did get an extra day of fishing with Lefty, <laughs> even though I was a festival fan. I have so many friends in this room, and I have so many people that I have fished with really all over the world. Jim Wolfenson, we had to leave a little bit earlier. We were in Kachaka together, and Bruce back there, we were on the Kola Peninsula in, in Russia. I've been to Terra del Fuego with some of the people who have offered testimony, my friend Ivan Chenard. And, and Tom McGuane and fished throughout the saltwater flats. I don't want you to get the impression that I'm a master caster. I'm not. Uh, you know, I'm constantly fine tuning and working at it. But part of the appeal for me is the camaraderie. The camaraderie I feel in the room here tonight. The common cause that brings us together. The great idea that you can go out in a trout stream or in a salmon river or in the flats or go to the far corners of the world. And there you are with a fly rod and some kind of an imitation fly. And you are in a zone that is unlike anything else that I've ever been in in my lifetime. The hours go by. You're surrounded by the most beautiful forms of life, not just in the water, but on top of the water and all around you. And it is, I think, the greatest kind of therapy that you can possibly imagine. But I'm always gone back to the first time I really got involved in fly fishing. I went and bought a six weight Orbis rod sometime in the early 1980s. I started fishing on the snake in, in uh, Jackson Hole. And I was getting reasonably good at it because I'm a good enough athlete. And I was down on the snake and there was a big float trip coming around the corner. And I thought, I'm going to give him a little feel for what it's like to be a fly fisher. Stripped off a fair amount of line, did two back casts. And just as they went by, I let it go, including two sections of the rod. <laughs> and while blinking an eye, I just reeled in very slowly, <laughs> as if this is how it always goes. <laughs> so thank you all very much. It's a great cause tonight. We're going to take.